Hi, welcome to Autonomous Mobile Robots. I'm Roland Sigward, your teacher for this first segment. This first segment intends to give you a kickstart on the main questions and also the topics which we will treat in this course. Let us directly start with the problem a mobile robot is facing while navigating in its environment. In order to freely operate in its environment, mobile robots have to address three more main questions. First, they have to know where they are, so the question, where am I? The second question is, where am I going? So where I'm heading to? And then, of course, the last question is also, how do I get there? These are fundamental questions for navigation, which is actually also the same questions humans or animals has to ask if they want to navigate, which is a very important task in daily life. In order to address these questions, the robot has to have a model of the environment. This can be automatically built or given a priori by a human. It has to perceive and analyze the environment in order to compare it with the map and then find out its position, situation within the environment. And it has to plan and execute the movement. In this course, we will go always along this see, think, act cycle. This actually is the main element which a robot has to do. It's somewhat a control cycle where the robot has to perceive its environment. It has then to localize itself within this environment. It has to have um, a cognition part, which uh, is mainly path planning, which uh, allows to find its best way for a given mission. And then, of course, the robot has to be able to move in its environment to generate the actions of the wheels to get from A to B. So we'll always come back to this the think act cycle and today, in the introduction, we will have a short look at all the four main blocks of the the think act cycle. Let us first start with the um, act cycle or motion control cycle, where we have uh, the kinematics and the motion control. So first of all, we have to think about how we propel the robot. If you think about a wheel robot, you have different type of wheels. These wheels impose constraints on the robot. So there are so-called rolling constraints and non-sliding constraints. So typically, as you can see here, an example of a standard wheel. This wheel can, this wheel can roll in one direction and can, should typically not slip in the other direction. Now, in order to develop the kinematics of a mobile robot, you have to put all the wheels which are uh, selected for the robot together and all the constraints together with the rolling and sliding constraints, you can develop the real the kinematics of the robot. So the kinematics typically gives then the motion control function, which means that you can the cal uh, calculate the speed of the robot in the plane with x, y and theta as a function of the speed of the wheels which are given here, so depend on the number of speeds. And of course, also the geometry of the whole entire robot will get into this equation. This equation we'll see in the course how to develop it. And it's probably somewhat straightforward once you have selected different wheel, uh, wheels for your robot. In order to control the robot, very often you have the opposite question. What are the speeds you have to control on the individual wheels? If you have given a, different, a, a given speed in the world frame, so the given speed in x dot, y dot, and theta dot. This is very often not so easy to calculate. In principle, it's the inverse of the, the other equation. But very often, the number of wheels are not three. And so you have to invert a function which is not really directly invertible. So we will see in the course how to do this and how to deal with this in mobile robotics. So the second important, very also important part is perception. So if the robot wants to know where it is in the, in the situation, first of all, it has to sense in its environment. So the robot can have internal sensors which are measuring internal states, but the main sensors for navigation and localization, which we'll see later on, are, for example, laser scanners 
or cameras. Laser scan is what you can see here, do typically scanning the environment with a laser beam, which is measuring the time of flight in order to get to an object and be reflected on the object. So you're measuring really the time of flight of the light beam, and then you are scanning in this situation now in a plane. And this allows you to extract, for example, then the walls, and these walls later on allows you to localize the robot. Cameras are today extremely well used. They are also cheap, and they give very rich information about the environment. On the other side, cameras um, are not active sensors, so they have typically a pretty bad signal-to-noise ratio, and you have to extract information on different levels, which we will see in the next slide. Apart these main sensors, which allow typically for localizing the robot uh, in the environment, you might imagine to have a lot of other sensors, as you can see on this uh, part of the slide. You have, for example, a GPS sensor, which allows you to localize the robot globally in the environment. You have an IMU, which allows to have um, the state in angular and angular speeds of the robot and uh, accelerations. And you might also have additional cameras in different ways. And for example, for so-called um, proprioceptive sensors, which are allowed to measure the speed of the wheels um, um, of the robot. So have us, let us have a, a little bit more closer look on the perception part if you have a camera. As mentioned, with cameras you have rich information, but typically you have to find, uh, to extract some key elements of the image so that you can really compare this with, for example, a map. In this first image you can see how this can be done if, for example, you are interested at edges, which are, are very often very interesting parts of images. So you have first the image, you extract the edges, but they are still a little bit blurred. Then you have some additional treatment, and at the end you come up with an image which uh, precisely define where the edges are, and each edge um, in, uh, are typically given by a line, which are uh, a combination of single points. Another element which is typically used in uh, with camera images are so-called key point features. Key point features are typical representation of local information, for example here, which can be somewhat considered as gradients in different directions. There are different ways how to extract this, and there have been in the recent time uh, different proposals of uh, so-called uh, key point features, for example, fast, surf, sift, or brisks. All of them have something in common, so they try to, in, a, in an image, to find in a local point, around the point, gradients, for example, in different directions. And these gradients are then representative of this uh, point feature. So if you have good point features, there typically are also rotation, scale, and view invariant. So you can actually work, um, uh, have the, the same features seen from different point of views, from different uh, resolutions and even with different illumination, and you should still be able to compare features from one image to the next. One example can be seen in, the, in this video, which we can see right now. So here you can see that um, the features are from one image tracked to the other image, and this can be done extremely robustly with today's uh, um, very sophisticated features. So the next step, if once you have um, perceived the environment, you have extracted features or different elements of the environment, you try to localize the robot in its environment. For doing this, you have on one side the information from the sensor coming in, but also then information from the maps, from the knowledge base. And you're trying to compare what you have perceived of the environment with what you have seen, uh, what you have stored in the map, in order to bring the robot in its relation to the local environment. Let us see this on this uh, slide, how this typically is done and implemented. Imagine, first of all, the robot is in, in, in here in an environment with three pillars. This is the three pillars represent the map. The robot starts up at a given point, has no prior information, so it, its belief about where it is in the environment is equally distributed, as you can see here. Now, in the first step, the robot sees with its sensor a pillar, and once it sees a pillar, but it has a limited range for seeing 
in its environment, it uh, can infer from this that you can be in front of this pillar, but probably also here and here. So the belief distribution where the robot is changes and you have three peaks. Now in its next step, the robot typically moves forward. This is an action step. By the action, without actually in parallel looking at the environment, the robot gets less certain about the environment. So the belief actually is reduced and the, orders, the, peak, the peaks are moved forward with the motion of the robot. Now at one point, the robot takes a second um, view of the environment, as we can see here, and then it can again argue about where it is in the environment. As we have seen before, if you consider only what the robot sees, you have three peaks, but now if you combine this with the prior information, which is in blue, then there is a clear, strong peak at one point, and this, is, of course, then represents the most probable position of the robot and can be then used also for planning. So the next step after localization is typical planning. Planning means that you think about what um, you, where, how you can get from A to B, um, especially based on a mission command, which is typically given by the operator of the robot. So planning means that the robot starts at a certain point. It has some knowledge about its environment. For example, it knows that there are obstacles in the environments, as you can see it here, and it has to go to a given goal. Now, of course, it's easy to understand that a robot can have quite different paths. It can go around here, it can go in between. And now the planning part or the cognition part is to find the best movement from the current point to the goal point um, on the different uh, restrictions. And this, of course, uh, implies in some situations a very complex uh, planning process. And this is typically this divided in two parts. So the first part is the global planning. In global planning, in most cases, you cut down the environment in smaller pieces. And so you get up with the graph, and then you can plan in the graph and find actually the best connection in the graph from the starting point to the end point. As you can see here, in the graph, you can also represent obstacles, for example, in order to not collide in the environment. The second part in the planning is typically a local plan path planning, which uh, has to ensure that you don't collide with the environment. For example, if there is elements which are not in the map, or if there are dynamic uh, obstacles in the environment, like humans or other robots. This is typically done, as you can see it here, that you first have a sensor, you look at the environment, for example, with a laser sensor, and you see the different obstacles, you see the free space, and then, using the kinematics of a robot and what it has seen, you find different trajectory which allow the robot to move forward and you select the best one. It's typically an optimization, optimization process in order to go forwards to with the, the global goal the robot has defined. So this gives you a, a rough summary about the four elements which are important for the see, think, act cycle and which will be discussed in the context of this course. So this course is a collection of about 30 short video lectures that we call segments. The segments are then complemented with short questionnaires for each segment. So to ver verify your understanding and progress in the lecture, we will also give various exercises with, with more details and also complement it with uh, videos showing the current state of the art in the field. This lecture is based on the lecture which we are giving since a couple of years at ETH Zurich on autonomous mobile robots. And it's also based on the textbook Introduction to Autonomous Mobile Robots, uh, which is authored by Ila Norbask, David Escaramuza, and myself, and is published in MIG Press. This lecture is given by six different teachers. Apart myself, it's Paul Ferge from ETH Zurich, it's Marco Hutter, also from ETH Zurich. It's Margarita Klee at the University of Edinburgh. David Escaramuza from the University of Zurich and Martin Rufley, which is with IBM Research in Zurich. So we invite you to join this course. After the course, you should be able to contribute to, to the navigation and building and design of mobile robots. 
And I would like to end here with an example of such a robot system which freely navigates in a city-like environment is this robot, which we call Europa robot or Obelix, which has different sensors, for example, laser sensors, cameras in the eyes, and has a differential drive here um, to propulse the whole system. You will see now a, a short sec sequence of this environment. In the image, you can see on the left the local perception by the laser. You can see then also the camera image on the top left, and in the middle, you can see more or less where the robot is in a global context. You can see this robot actually knows where it is precisely in the environment based on all the information, but it also can reliably and very safely avoid collision with humans. And here it made a long trip of 3.2 kilometers from the University of Freiburg to the downtown of Freiburg in Germany. We look forward to having you as your students in this course and hope this introduction gave you enough motivation to follow up with the course. Thanks very much and see you again.